chapter 3. That's where we're going to be at. Uh, we only have two weeks left in this series, counting this week. Next week um, will be the, the final message in our Philippian series. And I have to tell you, uh, I've enjoyed the series. Um, I, I enjoy where we're at in the fall time. Fall time's my favorite. I don't know how you guys feel, but I've got to press through and push on through summertime and uh, kind of like spring. I just don't, I don't dig it. I don't like it. Fall rocks. Christmas rocks. You guys are going to hear that for the rest of my uh, life here. That's how much I love Christmas. I'm sorry beforehand, but I won't apologize for it again. Christmas rocks. Um, and that's, man, I love it. It's like a lot of people live for that because it's football time, right? You go through the misery of summer and spring, and you're waiting for football to come back around. And some people live for football. Other people live for golf. I don't know how they live for golf. Golf is like the most boring sport on the face of this earth. <laughs> Next to racing, it's like, let's watch a car go in circles 300 times. I actually have heard that actually going to the race is quite fun. The actual experience of going to the race, I just, that's, that's not me. Uh, baseball, I, I can watch it live, but watching it on TV, I just, man, it just seems so long watching it on TV. People love sports. They live for sports. Some people live for money. Some people live for power and fame. Um, but we want to look at this morning, what does Paul say you should live your life for? In other words, what is the goal of life? For me, as a high school student, it was football, no doubt about it. Um, once I was going through football, kind of my senior year, I started to think about my profession, and my mom was in the medical field, and so I thought the goal of my life was to go into the medical field and have a family. Once I got into the ministry, arrogance swelled up on my mind, and I thought, well, what's the goal of ministry? Well, it's to be a speaker and let people listen to my eloquent wisdom and speak to thousands of people. And wow, did I have a rude awakening when I found out I just wasn't cut out for that type of, uh, of speaking. And, and you know, God has a way of humbling us in life. Um, we think that we're great, and we find out we're actually nothing. And that's what Paul says in Philippians chapter 3. He recognizes that every good thing about him and about his life is nothing in comparison with Jesus. Paul says three things about the goal of life in Philippians chapter 3. He says, more than anything, I want to know Christ. I want to understand the power of his resurrection. And I want to attain the resurrection from the dead as a citizen in heaven. In order to accomplish your life, you have to be watchful. Being a father to Piper, and she's growing up, and she's crawling, and she's standing, and she is all over the place. I've got to create boundaries and barriers just because she's so excited about checking out everything. I'll put down a pile of toys on the floor, and she wants nothing to do with those toys. She wants everything to do with everything that's dangerous. Um, I, I just I keep my eye on her all the time. I watch over, and I see her go down to the floor and pick something up and look at it. And then it starts going right towards her mouth. And I jump up really quick, and Angel gets all upset. She's like, what's going on? What's going on? And I run over to Piper, and I grab what's out of her hand. She's got a piece of plastic. Last week, she had a long stick. It's ridiculous. I'm like, stop doing that. I'm going to have to put you in your cage here in a minute. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Just kidding. I don't do that. I don't do that. <clears throat> yeah, that would be pretty terrible. But we have to be watchful. We have to be alert. And what Paul says here, the only way to accomplish the goal of following Jesus, of attaining the resurrection, of understanding more about him, is he says you have to be watchful. If you'll join me in Philippians chapter 3, we're going to start in verse 1. And he says, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again is no trouble in me, to me, and it is a safeguard for you. Repetition, right? Write the same thing. Preach the same thing. And he says, I want you to be aware, be watchful of the dogs, be aware of the evil workers, be aware of the false circumcision, for we are the true circumcision who worship in the spirit of God and the glory in Christ Jesus, and we put no confidence in the flesh. Be watchful, be alert. Now, a lot of you are from around this area, Baltimore, but for those of you who aren't, Baltimore is known for its strategic place um, in different battles throughout America's history. Uh, the War of 1812, Baltimore was a strategic location. In fact, Baltimore is known for a very prominent drummer boy. I don't know if you know this, but this drummer boy, um, he actually inherited a drum from his father. His name was Michael. And this drummer boy, his name was Harry. 
And, and Harry beat the drum to sound the alarm for different type of tactics on the battlefield. He would beat the drum for different type of invading armies that would come. He would beat that sound, and it, it would alert. That's how they communicated. Now we communicate through microphones and telephones and Internet. But back in those days, they had to communicate through a drum. They didn't have machines to watch things for them. They didn't have buttons that would go off. They had to sit there and watch. Can you imagine that, having to sit there and watch for hours upon hours, and they would have rotating shifts? Well, Henry, um, legend goes that at the age of 16, uh, he and his unit, they were defending Baltimore at Fort McHenry, and during the fall of 1814, he helped sound the alarm that the British Army was approaching. And as the battle raged and as the rockets went off and exploded, not literal rockets, but you know what I mean, he stayed to his post and he beat that drum and he sounded the signals for the different types of tactics that were happening. And that's what it means to be watchful. In fact, you can actually go, they discovered his grave, I don't know if you know this, they discovered his grave in 2012 and they've actually marked his gravestone now, the drummer boy of Fort McHenry. Baltimore honored him on his gravestone and I think that's really cool, right? That this person was so watchful, despite the chaos that was going on around him, he beat that drum and he stayed vigilant. Now Paul says in order to accomplish the goal of knowing Christ and attaining the power of the resurrection, we have to be watchful for three different types of people groups. The first type of people group he calls are dogs. Uh, now that's not too kind, is it, right? I mean, can you imagine calling somebody a dog today? But Paul, he didn't pull any punches. He laid it out there. He said, you watch out for these dogs. Now this word dog meant a lot more to them than it does to us today. When we think of dogs, we think of kind, cuddly, little, nice animals that we want to snuggle up next to. Unless you're allergic, then they're like the plague of death. But that's how we think about dogs. For them, a dog was a scavenger. A dog was a spiritual predator that fed on other people. In fact, there may be some dogs in this room, some people that may look like Jesus, act like Jesus, but inwardly, they are scavengers that feed and suck the life out of people trying to live a life for Jesus. They go from one argument to the next. They go from one issue with a person to the next. They never seem to get along with anyone, and all they care is about praying and scavenging off of the spiritual health of other people. Paul said, you need to watch out for these types of people. And if you have anyone that every time you're around them, you always feel like it's work and it's draining and it's exhausting just to hear what this person has to say and what they're going through, and they can never seem to get along with anybody, you might be around a spiritual scavenger. The Bible says this in Revelation 22:15. He says, outside, talking about inside heaven, outside hell, outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the immoral persons and the murderers and the idolaters and everyone who loves and practices lying. These people are bent on a pathway to hell. And so Paul says, you need to watch out. They can interfere with your goal of following Jesus. He says, the second thing you need to watch out for are evil workers. These people have an inward meanness that flows outward to rotten character. Just people that are just simply mean. Always have something negative to say. You never feel encouraged or uplifted or motivated when you're around them. And they simply are rotten. This word means to be poisoned, to be um, uh, rotten, spoiled. That in their thinking and in their acting and in their feeling, they're like rotted wood just deteriorating away. The psalmist writer wrote this. Depart from me, ye evildoers, that I may observe the commandments of God. You see, when we allow evildoers to come into our company, right, and they start affecting us and determining our outcomes and our choices and interfering with our relationship with God, we have to be alert. We have to be watchful, just like the drummer, aware of the oncoming enemy. And then he says, number three, be aware of the false circumcision. These were Jews, Right? These were Jews who were proclaiming the way to the Lord is to be circumcised and be a Jew. But yet, Christ said the way to the Lord is by faith, through the channel of grace that takes place in baptism. He says, I want you to be watchful because these people are trying to rob you of the resurrection of Jesus. They are saying that Jesus didn't rise from the dead. They are saying that Jesus isn't the awaited Messiah. We've got to wait for that person to come because he'll restore Israel to its true power. And yet Paul says, Jesus has come. Israel is spiritual now. 
I've got a couple verses that I want to share with you about if there's a false circumcision, right? Circumcision means to cut away the dead flesh. If there's a false circumcision, then there is a true circumcision. And the Bible has a lot to say about being circumcised, but it doesn't talk so much for the Christian about the flesh. It talks about the spirit, our heart. Look what Paul has to say in Romans chapter 2. He says, for he is not a Jew who is one outwardly. You're not a Jew by the color of your skin or the genes that flow through your veins. He says, nor is circumcision that which is of the outward flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly. And circumcision that is of the heart by the spirit, not the letter. And his praise is not from men, but from God. To be a Jew means to be a praise of the Lord right? That's what a Jew was. That's why they called themselves Jews. And when Christ came, no longer did he require people to be circumcised and to worship according to the old law, but now he required people to come to him by faith. And that when we come to God by faith, he circumcises our heart. He cuts away the sinful nature and he gives us something new. But when does this take place? When do we become spiritual Jews in this sense? When do we have our heart circumcised? Well, Paul tells us that also. In Colossians chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, he says, In him you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, and the removal of the body from the flesh by what? The circumcision of Christ. When? Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were raised up with him through faith and the working of God, who raised Jesus from the dead. You see, the only way that you can come to Christ and to have your heart circumcised is by faith, through the channel of grace that takes place in baptism in water and you resurrect to walk in newness of life. Paul says you gotta watch out for people that are trying to rob this from you. And you know what? Satan's smart. If I was Satan, I would attack three things. I would attack the deity of Jesus. If you can get people to believe that Jesus isn't the son of God and didn't resurrect from the dead, they're gone. I would attack the inspired word of God. If you can get people to realize and believe that the Bible is just a book of fairy tales and a story and isn't historical and can't be trusted, you've won. And I would attack the plan of salvation. If you can just divert when people are saved and you can trick them into thinking that you don't need to be baptized, you don't need to have complete trusting faith in Jesus, you don't need to follow the Lord, if you can get them to think, all you have to do is say, "Uh uh-huh, do you believe in Jesus? Uh Uh-huh, and you're saved. He's tricked you. Or, if you can get people to believe, you gotta earn your way to heaven. You gotta work towards this thing. Grace isn't a gift, it isn't free, you have to earn it. You see, these are are plants by Satan to divert you. And that's what Paul says, do you wanna resurrect with Jesus? Do you wanna know him and value him? Watch out for people who are trying to take this from you. You see, the key understanding is simply this. You're in dangerous territory when you put the majority of your focus on what you do rather than on what Jesus did on the cross. We have to focus and know that what Jesus did was valuable. And that's what Paul goes on to say here. Watch out for these people. But he says, I'm going to put my focus here. Look at Philippians chapter 3 verse 4. He says, although I myself have confidence even in the flesh... You guys want to talk about flesh. He goes, look at what I've got. Look at my resume. He says, if anyone has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I've got more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the nation of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin. If there's anyone that's a pure blood, he says, it's me. He says, I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law, a Pharisee. A Pharisee was the elitist, the top-notch ranking people in the Israel society. The most spiritual men knew the law like the back of their hand, very righteous individuals according to the law. He says, as to zeal, if anybody was passionate about following God, it was me. He says, I was a persecutor of the church. I told these people that they were wrong. I oversaw their deaths. He says, as to the righteousness which is in the law, I was found blameless. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted what? A loss for the sake of Christ. You want to focus on who's got the good resume, Paul says. I've got the resume. But my resume is nothing compared to knowing Jesus. He says, whatever things were a gain to me, those things I have counted as a loss for the sake of Christ. Verse 8. More than that, I count all things to be lost in the view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus as Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them to be but rubbish, 
Rubbish is garbage. Rubbish is poo. <laughs> that's, the real, that's the actual word. I've count these things to be human waste in comparison to knowing Jesus. Verse 9, that I may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death in order that I might attain the resurrection of the dead. We've already pointed out the first thing that he talks about here, worldly accomplishments. And I think that we can all be there. I shared some of my arrogance with you earlier. We always think that we are the best at what we do and we could do no wrong. But the simple truth of the matter is there's always somebody that's better. There's always somebody that's more spiritual, more knowledgeable, more skillful. Someone is always better. And that's what Paul tries to do is he tries to show them, look, you guys think that this is good. This type of level of living is good. I was here. And being here means nothing compared to knowing Jesus as Lord. This word knowing, um, it means to excel in knowledge. It means to surpass in worth, superior, beyond, above. It means to be out of this world. To know Jesus is far above everything that you could ever imagine or want. David wrote in Psalm 73, 25, Whom have I in heaven but you? And the earth has nothing that I desire except for you, God. That type of relationship with God, that type of desire to want nothing other than God, that's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Knowing Christ as Lord should far outweigh everything we do in life, our success. But here's the question. Are we living like that? Do we live as if knowing Jesus is far more valuable than anything? Is it more valuable than turning on the TV first? Is it more valuable than playing video games before you go to bed? Is it more valuable than checking your mind out by reading a good novel or staying up late at night to do your work? Is it more valuable than a sports program on Sunday or some type of extracurricular activity? Is knowing Jesus and having a relationship with him more valuable to you than everything? Only you can answer that question. You see, Jesus doesn't care if you're rich. Jesus doesn't care if you're an American. Jesus doesn't care if you're powerful or if you're educated God is colorblind, and he sifts through the prides of our life. All that Jesus cares about is knowing him, knowing the power of the resurrection. So we have to be careful. We have to be careful that in talking about the goal of life, if we are going to attain this, we cannot allow these things that interfere and dictate with our relationship with Jesus. We can't let these things dictate our character. We can't let these things dictate our faithfulness. We can't let these things dictate our happiness. We cannot let these things dictate our relationship and our knowledge and our salvation with God. Paul says these things are rubbish, trash, garbage in comparison of knowing Jesus. He says in verse 8, more than that, I count all of these things to be loss. He says, I have suffered the loss of all things. I wonder how many of us can say that. How many of us can say that we have suffered the loss of all things? Now, I know a lot of people in this room have experienced hurt and pain and suffering and have probably suffered a lot. And we all suffer individually in our own different ways. And, you know, something that I was driving uh, here to church this morning, something that hit me uh, as I was thinking about this suffering is simply this, is that really, truly, in life, suffering brings us closer to God. And I've had certain tragedies, certain failures, certain self-inflicted wounds that I've brought upon my own heart and my own life, but yet I had to look back this morning and I had to thank God for those terrible things that took place, knowing that they made my faith stronger, that they brought me closer to the Lord, that they increased my knowledge and my treasure of following God, whether they were self-inflicted or brought about by God. And I think that's where God wants us to get, and I'm still trying to get there, that I know, and this is the hard part, to want to know more about God is going to be hard. It's going to hurt. It's going to be challenging. I may lose everything to to, to know more about God, and I pray that that does not happen, but I had to say, God, I trust you, that whatever you're doing in my heart, whatever you're doing in my life, I know it is to bring about the good because you love me and I love you. 
And that's where Paul was, is that he lost everything. Status, physical health, safety, security, even his own head, he lost for the sake of knowing Jesus. And that is valuable, if you ask me. Jesus put it like this. He said, for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world, but in the end forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? I was reading a story this week, um, a lady in Russia, she had a newborn baby and she got caught trying to sell it for 1,500 euros. Isn't that crazy? I mean, that some, some cra- I mean, as a father, let alone as a mother who has that unique special connection with a child, can you imagine putting your child up for sale, trying to sell it for the sake of monetary gain? The most precious and valuable thing that God can give us in life, being family, And yet, this woman was willing to sell it. And she got caught, by the way. And she said this, my life is difficult. I did not have a choice. I had to sell my son, but now I want him back. And I think about that for our relationship with God. What is worth your eternal salvation? Surely these things are not worth your relationship with God. Sex, addictions, surely these things aren't worth it. And that's where Paul came to be, is that he experienced Jesus in such a way that nothing in life was worth knowing Jesus. He goes on to say in verse 9, that I may be found in him, not having a relationship, or excuse me, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which comes through faith in Jesus. We are saved by grace, through faith, in baptism. And here's the good news, that when God sees us obey the gospel, He does something, right? God has a mind, and he does this. I declare you not guilty. That is so awesome because it means that you can't earn it, you can't gain it, that the moment that you're immersed into Christ, God says, I declare you not guilty. This is what it means to have imputed righteousness, right? Imputation means to declare, to speak. It it was often used in an accounting term. You have credits and you have debits, right? You have a whole list of debits that comes out of your account. And that's what it's like with our sin, that when we come before God, we've got zero income and we've got a long list of debits that goes on for millions and millions of pages. And when we come to faith in Christ, God says, your debits have been canceled out. I now give you credit and it's maximum. You cannot run out of credit. And that is what righteousness of Christ is. When God declares it and speaks it to be, that he is determined in his mind, he is no longer going to view you as you, he's going to view you as Jesus. And that's why righteousness and faith in Christ is so valuable. It is free, and it was given at a very, very deep price with the blood of Jesus. You see, this righteousness that we have, Paul talks about, motivates us. He says in verse 10, I want to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, that I may attain the resurrection of the dead. Here's an interesting thought. Paul actually viewed it as a blessing, as an honor to bear the reproach of Jesus. In other words, Paul thought it was honorable and a gain in life to suffer like Jesus suffered. I mean, can you imagine that? being forsaken by your friends, beaten across the back with a cat of nine tails that ripped the flesh from your bones, being crucified on a cross for hours. And yet Paul says to do that is honorable because I'm being treated like Jesus and Jesus is worth more than anything. And so if you can see full circle, the goal of life, that even when life is so miserable that all you wanna do is roll over and die, Paul says that type of life is more valuable to me than all the riches and the glory and the prestige and the power that this world can offer me. And that is a very powerful statement about what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Peter said this. He said, but rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. And man, was it heartbreaking and tear-jerking when I had to thank God this morning for my sufferings that I've endured with Christ. It is not easy, but the Bible says rejoice. The goal of life is to have and know Jesus. You see, the power of the resurrection is to do a few things. To know this power means that you understand and you experience the influence that the resurrection should have upon your mind. Knowing that Jesus resurrected from the dead and you've participated in that should change your life. It should change it forever. 
To know the power of the resurrection is to know that Christianity is true. How many of you know, in your own mind, don't raise your hand, how many of you know the historical argument? That basically the historical argument is an attempt to prove the resurrection of Jesus Christ using logic and evidence from the word of God. To know the power of the resurrection means you don't have to walk around with an empty brain following fantasy stories. To know that this thing was historical, it happened. There are good arguments to prove that it is true. To know the power of the resurrection is to have confidence that being a follower of Jesus is rational and logical and intelligent and truthful. To know the power of the resurrection guarantees that we will rise again to live forever, trusting in eternal life. To know the power of the resurrection animates us in such a way that we can bear trials and endure persecution. To know the power of the resurrection makes it possible to endure pain and suffering in life. You see, the key phrase is simply this. Knowing the power of the resurrection puts our view of ourselves and our life into perspective. You see, a lot of us, we see things clouded. We don't see things as it truly is. We see things through the, through the process and the evaluation of materialism or power or sex or addictions. That's how we can be tempted to view life. And yet when we become a Christian and we follow Jesus, we stop processing things through our impulses and through our sinful nature and our sinful attitudes and desires, and we start seeing things top down. We start seeing things as they are, because we start seeing things through the lens of God, through the lens of the resurrection. Despite trusting in the redemption of salvation and looking unto Jesus, um, it challenges us. Because when you look unto Jesus, it exposes our inadequacies, our failures, and our faults. And that's what Paul says. All of these things that I thought were valuable, they're nothing. They're garbage. All of my life's hard work He studied the law probably from the age of 12 to the age of 30 before he was even allowed to speak in Old Testament church, memorizing the Pentateuch, the five books of the Old Testament, making sure to obey the old law exactly to a T. All of that hard work, all of that effort was nothing, was a waste compared to knowing Jesus. Look what he says picking up in verse 12. He says, not that I've already obtained this type of perfection or this resurrection or this righteousness. He says, or that I've already become perfect. But look a hold here. He says, I press on so that I may lay a hold of that which also I was laid a hold of by Jesus Christ. Brethren, I do not regard myself as laying hold of it yet. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. He says, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus. Let us, therefore, as many as are perfect, having this attitude, if anything, you have a different attitude, God will reveal that to you also. I think one of the most challenging aspects of life is when you look at your history, you look at your sin, you look at your trials, and even what you go through right now, one of the most challenging parts of life is being able to press on and move past that. Whether or not you've struggled with a certain type of sin, or you're coming off a divorce, or you think you failed as parents, you've gotten fired from your job, or whatever it is, it is really hard to move past those things. And why don't you think about Paul who's writing here? He's writing from jail, prison. He has lost everything. He's writing from Rome. This is after his shipwreck. This is after he's been beaten. This is after he's been bit by snakes and slept uh, in the cold, wet. This is after he's been stoned and left for dead. This is after all this suffering. Even more importantly, this is after Paul oversaw Christians being stoned and killed, hunting them down like animals. And he says, I look past all the damage that I caused and all the pain that happened to me. And he says, this is one thing that I've got to do. In order to lay a hold of this goal, in order to find what is valuable and knowing Jesus Christ is my Lord, in order to understand the power of the resurrection, he says, I have got to press on. I've got to move past this. I've got to go forward. And that's what I want to encourage you to do this morning, is that as we gather around the Lord's table, as we think about what it means to be a follower of Jesus, as we think about his broken body and his shed blood on the cross, and you have the temptation to think about all those sick, crazy weak, and all those struggles, I want you to put those things to the side. I want you to get the focus off of what you've done and put the focus on what Jesus did by dying on the cross for our sins. 
Paul says, look, I'm not perfect. Have you ever made a mistake? You're in good company. Have you ever fallen short? You're in good company. Paul says, man, I've been there, and I am going to press on to follow Jesus. You know, another cool drummer story. He's called the Ghost of Shiloh. Uh, The Battle of Shiloh was fought in southwestern Tennessee, and uh, um, it was fought by the Confederate and the Union Army during the Civil War. And the Union Army um, was led by Ulysses Grant, and his troop level was low. And so he was calling on reinforcements, and the goal was to attack in the morning once the reinforcements got there. But the Confederate Army got there first, and they outnumbered him. I I think it was like three to one. But I know that there were thousands more of the Confederate than there were of the Union. And the Confederate Army decided to launch an attack. And so they launched an attack that night. uh, And the Union Army, they fought well first. And then they started to deteriorate, as you can imagine. The surrounding army and the forces started to close in. And one of the commanding officers looked to the drummer boy, and he says, Sound retreat! Sound retreat! And this 16-year-old boy looked up at the officer and said, I never learned to retreat. I never learned the beat for retreat. And instinctively, he starts playing the drums and he starts sounding attack. And the officer, as you can imagine, is being, his troops are being swarmed, they're being slaughtered. And as this drummer boy sounds the retreat, all he can see is his soldiers starting to perish and die and then lose the battle. But yet something remarkable happened. As the drummer boy sounded attack, as he sounded attack and he beat his drum, the forces started to move forward and the Union Army started to repel the Confederates. And they were able to hold them off long enough for the reinforcements to come and Ulysses Grant took the, took the win that day. Reinforcements arrived because the little boy refused and was unable to sound retreat. He sounded attack, move forward, press on, overcome. That's what it means to press on. Retreat is not an option. There's only one way forward, and that's to follow Christ. The Bible says that when you're willing to place your faith in him, repent of your sin, be baptized, contact the blood of Jesus, God can declare and speak you not guilty. This is why we gather together to celebrate and proclaim the sacrifice of Jesus. God, thank you for your word and thank you for your body and for your blood. God, you broke yourself. You poured out your heart. You didn't retreat. You didn't run away. You went to the cross to die for us. And God, I pray that we'll be able to remember that sacrifice, that we'll be able to remember what you did for us. God, thank you for loving us enough to send your son to die on the cross for our sins, that in him we may have life and liberty, and freedom. God, we have the courage to walk away from the pain that we've caused and the pain that has happened to us and live a life knowing you, living for you, totally free of our sin and our guilt. God, as I take this bread, which is your body, and this cup, which is your blood, God, I pray that we will be strengthened, we will be nourished spiritually, that you will forgive us, Lord, continue to forgive us of our shortcomings and failures, and we have the confidence knowing that your grace and your salvation is there. God, we love you. We thank you. And we pray all of this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.